thrilled that so many of you are here tonight. What a great, uh, what a great thing for our community to come together and celebrate the history of Doty Island. I just want to see a show of hands. How many of you are Islanders? Woo! Okay, you probably know way more than we do, but <laughs> but we want to hear from you as well. Um, it's it's a great uh, learning opportunity for us when we have programs that we can can learn about the experiences of people from the past who who've grown up here and have all kinds of things to share with us. So we really encourage you to do that. I'm Jane Lang. I'm the director of the Nina Historical Society, and I'm very happy tonight to be working with the Menasha Historical Society on this collaborative program. And Kathy Homsky and Jeff Heiberman are my co-presenters tonight, and we'll each be doing a little portion of uh, the presentation tonight. I did want to just open up with a couple of announcements uh, related to the Nina Historical Society and upcoming events. This Saturday at 12.30 at Shattuck Park is our fourth annual intertribal powwow. So we encourage you to come to that. It will be a great event. The weather will be perfect. <laughs> yes, cool. Not overly hot, just perfect. And uh, we'll have Native American food that won't run out. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be a great event. So please come out for that. And it's free. <laughs> Yes, so please join us for that. And also I wanted to let you know that because this is a collaborative program with Menasha, and we're talking about Doty Island, which we share with Menasha, we thought it would be a great opportunity for us to split the programs and do tonight's program at the Nina Library and next month's program on October 17th, which is part two of the Hidden History of Doty Island. We'll be doing that at the Menasha Library, so please join us there. And that will also be at 7 o'clock. I think that's all I've got for announcements. Um, <laughs> so the hidden history of Doty Island was really kind of a conversation that started between um, Nick Jevney. And I'd just like to give a big shout out to Nick Jevney, who is the president of the National Historical Society. been so wonderful in um, videotaping and providing all kinds of um, AV support and all kinds of other support to us at Nina Historical Society. He'll be videotaping tonight and we'll be putting that, um, that recording on our YouTube channel on Historical Society's webpage and Menasha will be sharing it as well. So you'll be able to watch the program or share it with your friends and relatives who aren't able to be here tonight. So we're just so thankful to Nick. Um, but it started as a conversation. We were we started to think about some of the different things on Doty Island that they seem like you might know a little bit about them, but you probably don't know the full story, or at least you know a little bit more beyond just the surface information. And what we kind of wanted to bring to light is that sometimes our community's history is hidden in plain sight. Sometimes we have um, buildings that are, they've disappeared. They're no longer here. And it's hard for us to even remember what used to be there. So we'll be telling some of those stories, but we'll also be telling some of the stories behind buildings that are still here. And we have forgotten the meaning behind those buildings or why they were built in the first place. This is a 1938 aerial view of the island, and you can see uh, Nicolet Boulevard, or Nicolet Boulevard, as some people pronounce it, running right across the middle of Doty Island, and the north half being Menasha and the south half being Nina. To orient you, if you're uh, not used to seeing a view like this, the Kimberly Point is down on the bottom right. One thing I think is interesting with this, and we'll be referring to this a couple of times in the night, but note there's only one bridge from Nina into Menasha and from Menasha side of the island into Menasha. So when you think about that, the Oak Street Bridge wasn't even here for us to get to the hospital, which was lo is located still directly across from where we are now. 
came across this picture and I thought it would just be a great way to start. We're bringing Nina and Manasha together in talking about the hidden history of Doty Island. And I love this picture with the banners, Nina and Manasha. Though I was a little concerned by how stern some of these women look. <laughs> I'm hoping we have a little bit happier time tonight than it looks like they're having. So the Hidden History of Doty Island Part 1 tonight, we'll be talking about the Whiting Boathouse, the Roberts Resort, Picnic Island, which is now called the Isle of Valor, and the Memorial Building. We're starting out with the Whiting Boathouse, and this is a portion of the presentation that I'll be covering. Um, you might know where the Whiting Boathouse is, most of us do but how much of its history do we really know? Here's some just basic facts about it. It's located at 98 5th Street. It was built in 1931 by Frank Whiting. There was a party room added in 1939. The boathouse was enlarged in 1946 to accommodate the Naughty Gal 2, which was the uh, boat that came after the Naughty Gal 1. <laughs> And now it has been owned by the city of Nina since 1952. But who were the Whitings? George Whiting was born in 1849. He died in 1930 at the age of 82 of pneumonia. He was an incredibly hard-working businessman, having started in business at the young age of 16, decided to go out on his own and pursue business opportunities. One of the, well, the, the partnership that started Whiting Paper Company was a partnership he had formed with William M. Gilbert when he and William Gilbert formed the Gilbert and Whiting Paper Company in 1881. Gilbert sold to Whiting, and Whiting formed the Whiting Paper Mills in 1886. And Gilbert went on to form the Gilbert Paper Company. So two individual paper companies that were both located on Doty Island. George Whiting was also the mayor of Nina between 1884 and 1885. This was the home that George Whiting lived in on Forest Avenue. It was in what is now the 700 block. It is no longer there, though um, George and his wife, Edna Babcock Whiting, um, raised their son Frank in this home. Uh, they adopted him in 1885. They raised him in this home, and he maintained this home for 20 years after his father passed away. This is Frank Whiting, and there's a picture similar to this inside the Whiting boathouse. He's such a dashing, dashing man, debonair. Um, again, born in 1885, and he died in 1952. Frank was married three times. Bessie was the mother of his four children, and she sadly passed away in 1927. Then Frank married Gladys Cyril in 1932. Um, he unfortunately divorced uh, that woman, and then he married Merle Stevens, who was a well-known actress in 1940. And this is a picture of them vacationing in Hawaii in 1942, still looking pretty debonair. Um, and he passed away just 10 years after this photo at the age of 66 in uh, 1952. This is the home that Frank lived in at 620 East Forest Avenue. It was, it's still located on Forest Avenue. It was originally constructed in 1885 for a building contractor named David Barnes. And it was purchased in 1910 by Frank, who enlarged it with a two-story brick rear wing. What I love about this picture is look at the condition of Forest Avenue. <laughs> Ritzy. <laughs> Ritzy, as Jeff said, yeah. It's a dirt road, and there's not much going on, but the home is still there today. One of the interesting things that people might know about Frank Whiting is that he had a backyard menagerie 
or zoo. And we had the wonderful opportunity recently to do a videotaped interview of Betty Falvey Hill, who um, is in her early 90s, and she had grown up on the island. Her parents had grown up on the island. Her grandparents had grown up on the island. She had wonderful stories to tell us. And she confirmed the whole story of the zoo in the backyard of Frank Whiting's house. Um, according to Betty, they had a bear cub, a giraffe, which I, I can't even believe that, and, and a lot of small animals in cages. But the bear cub, according to Betty, would howl and disturb the neighbors. So they had to get rid of that. And it, the zoo really only lasted about a year. And Betty also wanted us to know that he maintained this zoo when he was between wives. <laughs> so here we are. This is the Whiting Boathouse. This is a later photo of the boathouse, though, and later I'll show you uh, kind of an evolution of how the boathouse changed over the years. You can tell this is a later one because the left side boat slip has been enlarged, and it was enlarged in order to accommodate the naughty gal, too. <laughs> this is the naughty gal. I mean, obviously, Frank Whiting was building the boathouse because he had a fascination and love of boats and had several of them. The Whiting boathouse was built in um, 1931 for $100,000, which is the equivalent of $1.7 million in today's dollars. I do have some artifacts on the side table that you might want to take a look at on your way out. And one of the things that I will put over there later is a contract that we came across that is the contract for just the fencing that surrounded the Whiting Boat House. But we found that in our collection. And it's kind of a fun artifact to look at. It's got Frank's signature on it. and just kind of takes you right back. This is a photo from the inside of the slip, so that kind of gives you a sense of what it looks like in the actual boathouse. And I don't think I said to you yet, but the Naughty Gal 2 was a 57-foot yacht. It was built in 1946, and it was the first post-war boat built by Burger Boat Company in Manitowoc. So here's a little bit of the evolution. You can see how the boathouse was changing over time. On the top is the original boathouse with the party deck. And then the next one is showing the expansion to fit the Naughty Gal 2. And then the bottom shows the um, party deck added after the expansion. expansion. So there was always really a strong interest in holding parties, is what I can tell. <laughs> And there we are, having some parties in the Whiting Boathouse. Um, this is a, these are a couple of photos that we had in our collection at the Historical Society. Um, one of the things that Betty Hill also told us, and we had read this elsewhere, is that uh, Frank Whiting really enjoyed Smith and Johnson jokes. And those were like s exploding cigars and exploding books and just kind of gag gifts that he would place around the, the boathouse and surprise his guests with. So I thought that was kind of fun. Um, there were a lot of people partying at Whiting Boathouse in the past. <laughs> Some of them included famous tennis stars like Pancho Gonzalez and Bobby Riggs and Dorothy Cheney. So pretty amazing. Um, and that we'll actually be talking Maybe at some point about the tennis club. <laughs> um, I wanted to read just a couple of accounts from the newspaper about the parties that were held at the Whiting. And this is one that was from um, August 2nd, 1940. In colorful South American costumes, in gay 90s attire, as clowns and gypsies, Miss Frances Whiting's guests, and Miss Frances Whiting was Frank Whiting's daughter. Miss Frances Whiting's guests gathered last night at the F.B. Whiting Boathouse on the Fox River at Nina for one of her popular costume parties. Mr. and Mrs. George Thompson Menasha were asked to act as judges, and they awarded the prizes for the best costumes 
to Miss Jane Gibson of Oshkosh and Diedrich Bergstrom of Nina. And it, it goes on to list every prize that was won. A lot of detail which we no longer seem to have in our local paper. Wait, do we have a local paper? Uh, here's, here's another one. Uh, July 28th, 1938. The engagement of Miss Isabel Whiting to Robert Schroeder, son of John Schroeder of Oshkosh, was announced Wednesday evening by Miss Whiting's father, F.B. Whiting, at a costume party given by Miss Whiting and her two sisters, Frances and Frederica, at the Whiting Boathouse on the Fox River at the Philip <coughs> Street. The announcement party was attended by about 150 members of the younger social set, the Fox River Valley. Dancing was enjoyed from 9 to 1 o'clock. <laughs> they knew how to party <laughs> with music furnished by an Appleton orchestra refreshments were served I love this a special feature of the party was a Hawaiian hula dance given by Miss Frances Whiting <laughs> <laughs> and here's just one more um, and this is also 1938 to give you a sense of who was attending these parties Mr. and Mrs. F. B. Whiting will entertain at a boathouse party on August 15th for a number of Hollywood guests expected to include Miss Martha Ray, motion picture actress, and her stepfather and mother, etc., etc. The Hollywood visitors will be in Nina during the time of the 1938 Inland Lake Yachting Association regatta. So there was just a lot of, a lot of fun happening at the Whiting boathouse. <laughs> After Frank Whiting passed away in 1952, um, he gifted in his will the Whiting Boathouse to the city of Nina, and the city of Nina still owns and manages it. This is a modern picture of the Whiting Boathouse. Uh, the boathouse has now been added as of 2011 to the National Historic Register, and it is home to the Nina Nottaway Yacht Club and also the Coast Guard Auxiliary. And I just, um, we have had so much fun researching these little stories throughout Doty Island. We hope that you'll enjoy them as well. But just know, we're only giving you just a little bit of flavor of the stories. There's so much more we could tell. But at this point now, I'm going to pass it over to Jeff Heimerman. Thank you, Jane. Hello, everyone. Hello. My name is Jeff. I grew up uh, across from Smith Park on Cleveland. Uh, left the area for a long time. Just came back about two years ago, five blocks from where I grew up. <laughs> That's where I live. Um, so my, my first topic is, is Robert's Resort. And uh, I've had a lot of fun with, with uh, this whole topic. Um, I, I did pick something out just you know the stress of life, correct? Um, here's this, what appears to be a news article, but it ends up being an ad. It said, the green lawns, the shady trees, the cool breezes, the pleasant, comfortable hotel, and the gentle flowing river, the peaceful scenery of lake and wood, all combined, <coughs> quiet the, and soothe the tired nerves of feverish humanity. Oh. <laughs> 1897. <laughs> In the rush and wild scramble of daily life, much of the beauty of life is missed. Take a day off and visit Robert's Resort. <laughs> so, so, just to the right. Um, uh, like I said, we're going to go back to the same uh, uh, overhead shot from 1938, and I'll try my best. It's a little difficult, but this is Doty Park. Right here is Roberts Resort. Right there would be uh, the Doty Cabin. Here's the long, here's the, the uh, pier with the, uh, the uh, gazebo on it. And in my heart of hearts, I believe he owned all of that for the resort. I mean, there's been different stories. One, he sold land off to C.B. Clark. He 
did some other sales, um, blah, 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 blah. any rate, um, this story of Robert's Resort um, actually starts in Menasha. Uh, by the way, there's only like, you know, we always had these such terrible times finding pictures for these topics. And then, you know, so I found two of, of Robert, uh, John Robert. So originally, um, <coughs> He was from upstate New York, spent his early career in the hotel business in New York City, Newark, Ohio, and you know, in the Whitney House in Columbus, uh, Wisconsin. He and his wife Martha came to Menasha from Columbus in 1870. John Roberts was to become the first manager of the new, brand spanking new, National Hotel built by R.M. Scott and Charles May. The National was about 60 by 90, three-story building on the corner of, uh, I guess, uh, Mill, uh, Mill Street and Main Street, where the Menasha Hotel ended up being later on. Uh, atop of that uh, was an observation tower with a grandiose 360-degree view of the lakes, the um, rivers, and the uh, manufacturing businesses on the water power. And I've been doing a lot of research on this stuff. I still don't understand fully when they use the term water power, what they're referring to, but I'll find out soon enough. <clears throat> as early as 1871, Robert's praises were sung widely and loudly by local papers. The Saturday Evening Press of September 30th, 1871 says, the pride of our city is our hotel, the National. John Roberts is the landlord and a complete success we find him. And it keeps going on like that. You know, this, he, he did some other cool stuff as well. He had a lot of initiative. Always trying to take care of the tired and the weary travelers, John built an eatery directly across from the Wisconsin Central Railroad Station. <laughs> and it became quite, a, quite the spot. <clears throat> he also signed a contract with Superintendent Harris to deliver mail to and from the depot in 1872. So all the people that were coming to the hotel, he was making a lot of money on the sides. <laughs> so these additional sources of income um, would be a critical component to, to John Roberts' ultimate goal, which was having his own summer resort with direct access to bountiful rivers and lakes. And that's where we see John retiring or quitting the National Hotel in, I think it was, 1875, and moving to Nina. Now, why would he do that? Not sure. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, in 1875, he quietly bought the Doty Loggery and all the land from that, from a guy named Hugh Ernsting, who shows up on a lot of plat maps as the Ernsting edition. Um, so, anyway, <clears throat> he wanted it for the express purposes of establishing a resort of his dreams on the southern shore of Doty Island. He hired uh, a fairly noted architect, uh, William Waters of Oshkosh, to design an appropriate, uh, an appropriate resort hotel. There's another house uh, that that uh, uh, Walt, uh, William Walter, Waters sorry, uh, designed as well, and that was the house of Jane R. Smith, Elijah Smith's daughter, on the opposite corner. Uh, that was quite a mansion. <coughs> um, I'm not going to go through the structure and all that. Um, well, you know what? I should probably move along. It's all right. So this is one of the remain one of the only pictures I've seen of the Menasha, I'm sorry, the National Hotel before it burned down, and this is at the corner of Main and Shoot or Mill, basically. I'd love, I wish they had the uh, observation tower on, on top. We do have another picture of John Roberts. He's the gentleman on the right hand side of your of the picture in the back. Uh, I guess, yeah, the tallest, tallest uh, gentleman there. But that's when he was an alderman in uh, the city of Nina. I guess that helped, uh, you know, 
get things passed for his, for his, his operation. By the way, I want to, for people who know that I've also written an article on the driving park that used to be down on the end of, of uh, Doty Island, it's interesting that both that park, which he was a, on the board for, and his hotel proprietorship both basically went from the same time period. 1877 <coughs> was when he started uh, the uh, started having, actually having people at the resort. <clears throat> so on May 28th, the, the, official, the resort officially opened. The notoriety and rave reviews followed shortly. Roberts was able to attract very wealthy clientele from major cities in numerous southern states. I see St. Louis a lot, Chicago a lot, Memphis a lot, even down into you know Louisiana. Um, <clears throat> And I think what helped with that, you know, you think, how do these people, how do these people travel all that distance just to come to this resort? Is that the central Wisconsin Rail had had already been through and they had a depot in Nina on Doty Island. <clears throat> so um, fun fishing, steamship excursions, an idyllic setting with virgin hardwoods meant everyone could choose how to relax and spend their vacations. The Nina Times of June 11, 1877, bragged that Roberts Resort opened with record business and fish galore. I mean, they're always supposedly well stocked with fish. Um, the uh, Wisconsin State Journal, August 7, stated, one of the most delightful places in this state where a pilgrim can while away a portion of the hot days of summer is Roberts Resort on beautiful Doty Island. The article continued, this place is already becoming a favorite with tourists looking for a good hotel. I should have moved on and I'm not really late. This is an artist's rendition of the design by William Waters. Um, you'll see later on, there are some pictures. We're all familiar with the, uh, whoops, that's, you can see it, I can see it, you can. <laughs> the council tree, which if you bring this forward and magnetize it, let's see if I can do that. I can't, probably not. But you can actually see the uh, Roberts Resort Hotel and the loggery right next to it under the right hand side of the tree. Can you point on the screen? Sure. See that? Roberts Resort. Right here is the Grand Loggery. And there's the gentleman standing <laughs> that you all missed, didn't you? So that's, that's why I wanted this picture. This is a great, it's from a number of stand, on stand points. <clears throat> um, but so the article continues and says, the place has become a great favorite with tourists looking for good hotel, a courteous landlord, Charming scenery and fishing and sailing that cannot be surpassed. I've read a lot of articles about locals with steamships come, you know, parking near Roberts Resort and offering excursions into Lake Winnebago as well. So where would that picture have been taken from? This one? Kimberly Point. That piece of that piece of land is not there anymore though. You would have to go right to the I think to the left of the lighthouse as much as you could and kind of lean out. <laughs> you, there was another picture that we had with a, a dredge that kind of looks like it's going towards it to take it out, but it's unfortunate. Um, so, as I said, uh, this has, has been very, very busy. Um, by 1878, Roberts added extra cottages to increase the hotel capacity. He started in 1877. <laughs> so, you know, famous people of the day, including General Phil Sheridan, President Lincoln's son, Robert, came to stay a while. As the word spread, the wealthy and the well-known began to flock to this near resort. As the 1880s began, Roberts Resort was continually packed and the resort started having regular dance parties. Um, 
and plays and, and, and orchestras and etc. And the locals could participate in that as well. And the locals started to intermingle with the guests. Yeah, the result of which, uh, in one case at least, in 1880, General Martin Beam of Chicago married a local Nina girl, Miss Lulu Case, whom he met on his regular summer visits to the hotel. I'm going to take a little uh, break here and, and point out you're looking at the uh, east side of the hotel built by uh, William Waters. You see the two gentlemen walking down the dirt road, right? What you may not see in this, and it's, it's hard, but if you, you zoom in on it, you see a frame and an outbuilding of the Grand Loggery. So it settles the case of where was the Grand Loggery, I think, at least in my mind. <coughs> Um, there's a pamphlet over on the table that has a lot of the upcoming pictures, but here are some docks around that curve we know so well from people who've been down along Doty Park and, and onto the land where Roberts Resorts uh, existed. Um, and he was getting rowboats from Winniconne and blah, 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 blah. <coughs> Here's a fairly good picture of the Grand Loggery. And you can still see the, uh, the resort hotel right next to it. I always get confused by this picture because it looks like it's not right next to it. It looks like it's, you know, but it's pretty much in, in line with the, the hotel. <coughs> Another one? I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> Well, we, we'll get yes. During the during the Roberts Re Resort time, it it was there. It is now in Doty Park. I will I'll come to that at the end. <coughs> um, so certain guests started to ask. Remember before you said they built a couple of ca extra cottages and cabins on the land. So guests started to ask whether they may build their own cottages <laughs> in, 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 on the land, and uh, <coughs> so. Certain guests asked to build or bring their own cabin to the resort. George Pullman, of the rail car fame, was one of them. The family of Percy Smith in Chicago first had a little cabin for their own use. Then he decided to go all out and build a house on Robert's Resort land. In 1887, the Nina Daily Times reported that President Grover Cleveland and a small party spent a few days fishing at Robert's Resort. That same season, proprietor Roberts offered, offered the Wisconsin 21st Regiment for their annual union, reunion, free use of his resort land and its boats. So, very nice gesture. <coughs> so, every good thing ends, doesn't it? Right? On July 9th, 1895, about 10.30 a.m., John Roberts was found dead at <coughs> at the bottom of the stairs in the resort hotel. Now whether his fall down the stairs caused his death or whether the heart issue was the cause of the fall was speculated in the press. Martha Roberts and her three children, he actually mentioned them before, um, John Jr., George, and Stella, uh, sort of uh, soldiered on for another eight years managing Roberts Resort. And then on October 3, 1902, Roberts sold the entire resort property to three gentlemen from Chicago who remodeled the hotel and planned to keep the resort open year-round. And actually to change the name of the hotel to, I think it was Pleasant View. Uh, so it was uh, Mr. and Mrs. Julius Clark took possession of the property in mid-April 1903 but they didn't pay their bills or their staff. <laughs> in November of 1906, Martha became plaintiff in a foreclosure sale against the Clarks et al. She bought back the property, and on April 30th, 1907, Martha sold the property to William J. Hay of Oshkosh, who in turn planted the land into properties for sale. John 
Strange and family moved to the hotel property. I think we've got a picture of them. This is a fairly good picture of uh, all these little cabins that were placed on the property. But here is the John Strange family. Um, well, they had changed this hotel into a living uh, house. <clears throat> so, I guess this ends with a question. And if you know it, don't answer it. <laughs> Where is this? Where? What is it? That is the front gate to Robert's Resort. Um, and if you looked, uh, here, I think you were right. You were up. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to this. And that gate uh, that we were just talking about is at the end of this tree-lined road. <laughs> you see it? You can, you can see it going up towards the end, and then it goes into the woods. But at that time, in the time when Roberts Resort was active, there were no residences on this side of this street, on that side, the south side of East Forest, and no one was back in along the water. Wouldn't you like to see that land? <laughs> Where was the ford? I'm sorry? Where was the ford between the island and the mainland? They talk about a ford between the two. I haven't been there yet. I haven't read it yet, at least. <laughs> um, so most of my um, research is highly dependent upon newspapers.com and uh, Tell me when it came down. Pardon? When did the resort come down? When did it, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So I got to ask answer two questions. One was, when did the resort come down? And the other one was, where? what happened with the Doty Cabin? Um, so the, as I said before, the um, John Strange family of the paper company fame bought this house, and it was their house until about 19... 65, when um, in, in before 65, uh, the Mrs. Strange wanted offered to uh, give the city the log cabin if they would take care of it. And I think it was in, I want to say 1923, 26, where's our docent back there? Two docents. Two docents. When was the, 1926? I think it was earlier. 23? Oh, whatever. <laughs> Close enough in, in, in this year. So I'm going to, um, I'm sorry, the last picture that I wanted to show you guys on this, and I'll move on quickly. I have to zoom in. Or I think time. Sorry. Um, is this. Uh, this is my own interpretation of where the front steps of Roberts Resort were. And it's based on that 1938 um, image. And knowing that a tennis court is a standard measure, it's two tennis courts. It's 240 feet from the pier. It's straight off from the pier. And then the, the, the gazebo's off to the side. But that's, if you were sitting at Roberts Resort on the veranda, this is what you were looking at. Yes. And that's off of Grand Street, right? Yes. Where they're building yes. the two What happened houses. to the building? <laughs> what happened? They demolished the building. And they're going to build two new houses there. Well, that one. Yes, that's, that's current, current news. Um, can I move on? Okay. So, uh, one of the, how I all got started in this business was doing research at Smith Park in Menasha. Um, so, this is a little little slice of it, but it gets to a lot of, of different things. I'll show you where we're going to be talking about. Does anybody know where Picnic Island is? Behind the map. Behind the map? Can you see it on the map? See that little piece of land out there? I think, I think that was a manufactured island. Between 1901 and 1928. So I want to take steps back from this and go back to 1897. 
Smith had just given a, the land between Kai's Park, the Avenue, and Cleveland to the city for a library and a park. He decided against the library. They decided to put the library down on Mill Street, Menasha, which was owned by Smith. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so he started in earnest to actually get a plan for the park. Uh, and believe it or not, it, ha it has a plan. It had a plan. I've never seen it though. But he hired um, a noted uh, landscape architect called, uh, named Olaf Benson, who was uh, a Chicago landscape artist, art architect that uh, designed and built uh, Lincoln Park. And so he invited him up for a walkthrough. And he, I think one of the things he said to Smith, I can't prove it, but the actions speak louder than words sometimes. He said, if you want an important place, enduring important place, it should have water frontage and water access. Remember, I said er, first, Smith gave the land between Kai's and the Avenue. Right? So there's three acres above Kai's between Cleveland and Park. And that three acres was mainly marshland. There was some high ground, but a lot of marshland. And over, he never actually, I, I should say, he, he, I think he may have seen partial of the work being done, or at least moving in the right directions, before he died in 1899. <clears throat> um, they really don't have a great picture of of that. You know, this is obviously a, later than 1928, but it's, it serves some purpose of, you can imagine Smith walking around the park with Olaf Benson, and first Benson talks about the, the uh, effigy mound, stay away from those. <laughs> and, and then um, I, they actually said that they were putting pipe, uh, putting in a, a well, and we're going to, we're hoping to have the windmill installed by April of 1898. And if you've seen that, <laughs> it's a joke. Sorry. <laughs> so Picnic Island is the real part of this talk today. And I would say one of the things that, that uh, I found really interesting is, um, is that Smith also hooked up with Henry Hewitt in 1899 or 1898, and both of them signed on to a surety bond to ensure the city of Menasha. And, and they were going to use the federal government dredge that was, I think, in Oshkosh at the time. It was local, so it was close enough. All, was, all Menasha had to do was pay for it. And the surety bond was there to make sure that the government got the boat back in one piece. <laughs> so he did that, and they dug uh, and created a channel from the park to the lighthouse, which we haven't talked about at all yet, but to the mouth of Lake Winnebago on the northern route of the Fox. <clears throat> um, this picture is from 1928. <clears throat> There are no pictures of the mem being built. Pardon me. I apologize. The things I wanted to show you here, besides the wood across the water, but that's a lot of wood, you know, waiting to go to uh, Menasha Woodware. It's the this is this is kind of the design that the uh, Picnic Island took. When they built it in 19, you know, from 1901 to 1928, uh, here's one of those infamous bridges. One of the things you notice here is that the water on this side is higher than the water on that side. And what they did uh, was build a small dam between the two dish, uh, between the two uh, bridges, and filled it with city water from a hydrant. <laughs> and they had a water sprinkler in there. This was basically a wading pond, bathing spot for folks. I was just reading about the development of Cleveland Street 
And it really didn't start occurring until the 20s. In fact, there was one, I put something in here about uh, Mrs. George Reese who fell down the steps in her barn. You know, on right Cleveland Street. <laughs> and, you know, or that they were, they were begging the city in 1916, 1917 to put in a sewer main and a water main. <laughs> so people depended upon the waterfront for that. You can see the little a remnant of the little dam right here. So it raised it just high enough. And I better get going. I'm not even going to. This one talks about the, uh, <coughs> the ability to, just that they have a water supply and other things. One of the other things that happened was that uh, the very first play, I believe, in Menasha from the Winnebago players was put on in Picnic Island. And Picnic Island, this was a, a, set, a scene set up from uh, Smiling Through was the name of the play. Uh, some friends and neighbors of, of my family were, were actually apparently in this. And I kept saying, how could they put a play on it? It looks like a real house, by the way, and it's not. It's, a, it's just a prop. But on that western side of, of the current Picnic Island, there would be plenty of room for a crowd. Plus, I found out sort of after the fact that they hired a, a bleachers, set of bleachers from Warren's University <laughs> for the two-day weekend. And that, now it's starting to make sense about the numbers that they, they, they said. So I'll stop, and I apologize for taking so long. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I did screw up. Yeah, one little bit. And so this the current. This is a very current looking thing. Uh, here's the Isle of Valor. I'm sorry, that was done. Built in, I think it's 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and there was one city, Menasha, with two Medal of Honor recipients. That's kind of an unusual. I think there's one or two other cities across the country that, that have that. And I don't know if these are the gentlemen that have that honor. I don't know. Here are the two from Menasha, uh, you know, Kenneth Stump and Elmer Burr. And I just paid to have my father-in-law's uh, military you know, recognition in that so. You guys can do that too if you want. So, Picnic Island, now Valor, Island of Valor. Thank you. talking about our wonderful memorial building and we cannot find pictures of the inside of the memorial building. Lots of pictures of the outside and the Isle of Valor but no pictures of the inside. So if anyone has any, uh, if you would just come over to the Historical Society, uh, we would scan them and give them back to you. So I will move on here and I just want to explain can you hear me talking okay I just want to explain that when you see old movies and they're kind of hard to follow because they go from one era to another um, my story is going to kind of do that as well since we don't have pictures of the inside of the building um, Nick Jevney who Jane mentioned before has been amazing he took pictures lately and that's what I'm going to use for the presentation. But the dramatic part is going to be the readings from the newspapers. And Menasha, at the turn of the century, had, Nina Menasha had five newspapers. <laughs> the Menasha Breeze and um, the Menasha Record, the Menasha Times. There was a German newspaper. So these 
clippings that I'm going to read to you are from the Menasha record. The first photo here is actually, it's going to take a minute to load, but Nick Jevney actually took this one. I got it. Oh, okay. Here we go. Oh, I love this. Okay. We can probably watch this over and over. But is this that beautiful drone presentation of the memorial building and the beautiful Isle of Valor behind it? Boat landing there and then looking down the river toward the Racine Street Bridge. I think it's just incredible that we have drones and that Nick has one that works really well um, to show us things like this. So, I could play that over and over. Anyway, so here's our memorial building, standing strong for 90 years, built in 1928. And throughout these 90 years, many children and adults have enjoyed the activities there. It's truly a community building. Uh, so I was able to find some newspaper articles from the 1920s and 30s, and I'll be using some of them in this presentation. And so we begin. The year was 1927. World War I had come to an end. People had more leisure time. Work hours were reduced. There was talk of building a recreational facility in the city. Mayor Nicholas Remmel led a plan to build a $25,000 recreational complex on the Smith Park shoreline. The project received immediate and enthusiastic support of the community. His residents had long wished for their own armory and the memorial building was seen as a healthy compromise. Amazingly, the building was constructed at no cost to the city of Menasha. That was made possible by the generosity of a few public-spirited citizens and the use of $6,500 remaining in the War Chest Fund, left over from World War I. So designed by Chester Wolcott, a Chicago architect, it's one of just a few local buildings still being used for its original purpose. The local contractor was E.F. Dornbrook. To make room for the building, the tennis courts were relocated across the street and into Smith Park. Excitement built as the building opening neared. On July 3rd, 1928, the Menasha Record reported, the 4th of July will be a gala event in Menasha. There will not be a dull moment from daylight until long after dark. The memorial building dedication, parades, races, fireworks, and Aeroplane stunts will be featured. Elwyn West, world famous aviator, is to give an exhibition at the park in the afternoon. Mr. West served as an aviator during the World War and has been giving exhibitions in various parts of the United States in the past eight years. Three bands will furnish music and a number of athletic events will take place, including boat races, swimming, diving, tennis, and hard and softball. The fireworks display in the evening will take place at the riverfront opposite the city park within view of people anywhere east of Namath Street on the island. <laughs> so the grand opening held on July 4th, 1928, was a huge success, reportedly enjoyed by more than 20,000 people. Ooh, that's amazing. So the memorial building is colonial in style, modern in every way, and has already been the subject of much favorable comment. Upon entering the building, one passes between massive white pillars, of which there are four. From the ceiling of the portico hangs a huge lantern of copper and glass in keeping with that colonial mode. I'm going to read this to you the plaque is still there on the right-hand side of the front door, and it reads, Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Building. God gave us sons. We gave them back to our country. 
and our country gave them back to God. This building is erected by the citizens of Menasha in sacred memory of those from our city who gave their lives in the service of our country. And the date below is 1928. As you pass through the front entrance, you see before you a handsome wide stairway with a black ornamental wrought iron railing. A newspaper article gave this description. The entrance hall contains the refectory, I had to look that up, it's a dining hall, <laughs> with a soda fountain and equipment for the serving of light lunches. Food is prepared by an experienced restaurateur and the aim is to offer high grade service at all times. Other features of the room are a specialty ice drinking fountain, a telephone booth for public Ooh. use. Ooh. Oh, I know. Ooh. Yeah, that, that's big, that's 1928, big. yes. The first floor also contains an office for the park superintendent, a kitchen equipped with a sink and electric stove, wow. locker rooms for men and women with modern shower baths with hot and cold water. <laughs> Lockers could be rented at the modest rate of 50 cents per month. Wow. <laughs> a good deal there. Okay. okay, this is one newspaper ad. And for those in the back who might not be able to read it, I will. Don't miss the big 4th of July celebration in Menasha. Eat your dinner or lunch at the Fountain Grill opposite the Orpheum Theater. That's those downtown Menasha. Visit our new Mechanicola soda fountain, the newest, largest, and most modern soda fountain in the Fox River Valley. We also own and operate the refectory in the new Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Building in the city park. Meals, lunches, soda fountain, treats, candy, cigars, and cigarettes, and fireworks. <laughs> so one of the first activities held at the MEM was an electric range cooking school. It was conducted for two days in May of 1930 by W.E. Held Electric Services. One lucky participant was the winner of a brand new range. The Park and Rec Department originally had its offices on the west side of the main floor. Offices of the city nurse and the dental hygienist were on the east side of the building. CPR, first aid classes, and babysitting clinics were held there. The doors at the rear of the hallway opened on a terrace of cement. Now, think about this in your mind because I'll show you a picture later. Uh, a terrace of cement which ran the entire length of the building and looked out upon the lagoon and beautiful picnic island. Tables and chairs were available where refreshments could be enjoyed and mothers could watch over their children at play in the sand or wading in the lagoon and uh, Jeff had pictures of that lovely wading pool in the lagoon. So now we're going back to the present. And we took pictures, Nick took the pictures on the inside of the building so you'll see what it looks like now. <coughs> Since the, the west side of the building, and they're just getting the school ready for this year, they didn't want us to take this picture because they weren't ready, but uh, it's home to Tiny Tot's three and four year old preschool. And that school started in about 1985. Uh, Sandy Skabronski has just retired and she's taught there for 33 years. Julie Bradley is the new teacher and the school provides a great start for children entering kindergarten. As we looked at this, Jane Lang noticed that the, there's a Fisher Price toy barn in one of the cubicles there. So we wanted to say, don't sell them if you have any of them. They're so durable, they can be used for your grandkids and maybe even your great grandkids. It's wonderful, the Fisher Price toys. Okay. Now, this is the upper level of the MEM at the current time. If you remember going to the MEM, you might remember attending dances in that hall. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to talk a bit about the Blue Inn 
Can you raise your hand if you've ever been to a blue in dance? Oh my goodness, awesome. Awesome. Okay. So the, there's a current gymnastics program there and a dance class. And our museum is directly below. And it's just great having meetings and guests and 30 kids doing gymnastics and jumping up and down and throwing hula hoops. Just delightful. Anyway, they're having a good time. So through the years, the second floor has had many uses, including exercise classes, wedding receptions, lectures, gymnastics classes, lessons in baton twirling, golf. My husband uh, had golf lessons there 40 years ago. I can't, I can't imagine practicing golf. I said, you must have lost a lot of windows. <laughs> he said, no, they had some kind of sheet up there. Anyway, and they had archery classes, meetings for many groups and many dances. Uh, more about the dances later. I'm going to go to a really interesting picture outside the mountain. I love this picture. And I wonder if any of you can remember swimming in the river behind the memorial building. We've learned from talking with people that they had high school students as lifeguards. Um, they had that nice diving board and slide, and uh, apparently they're having a great time. Um, I'm thinking that there were many kids from Doty Island who lived close and brought their uh, swimwear over to the memorial building and rented the, got the lockers and away they went for a day of fun. It's worth noting that during the 1927 planning, the construction of a second building was discussed. It would have stood right next to the mem and it would have had an indoor pool. Uh, due to financial reasons, that building was never constructed. River sit swimming ended in 1956, and on July 29, 1957, the Menasha Municipal Swimming Pool opened. As I think about that, there were dozens of those painful white rubber bathing caps when <laughs> <laughs> that pool started. And we believed that the chlorine at the pool was going to turn our hair green. So we all, oh, those caps were terrible. Two ladies I recently spoke with were employed at the pool when it first opened. They were toe checkers. That's right. Apparently, they were 50 cents an hour. You had to put your foot up on a sawhorse. And the toe checker looked carefully between each toe, making sure that we were okay to go in the pool. <laughs> oh my god, I forgot about that. <laughs> okay, so they had lifeguards and, and still do, of course, in that nice Venetia pool. Back then, they were paid 50 cents an hour. Wow. Okay, we're going back to the memorial The same memorial amount buildings. of toe checkers? I'm sorry? The same amount as a toe I checker? believe so. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know. What kind of training did they have to go through? <laughs> Quite a bit, I'm sure. Yeah. And not the toe checkers, though. Yeah, <laughs> that had to be pretty easy. <laughs> okay. So, you may have seen this picture if you've ever attended <laughs> dances especially blue in dances. In 1959, the memorial building was renovated at a cost of $30,000. I'm going back just a bit now because I want to talk about the second floor of the building. When first opened, the second floor was a drill hall and was used for veterans gatherings and other community functions. In addition, the large hall is suitable for dancing or entertainment of any sort. The room opens onto two balconies on either side of the stairway, surrounded by wrought iron railings, and contains benches to accommodate people between dances or for anyone desiring to rest or read when the hall is not in use. The view from these balconies is very fine, 
for in addition to the beauty of the waterfront, one can see far up the river. The hall is an excellent place for ladies to give afternoon card parties and teas, <laughs> while no pleasanter surroundings could be imagined for children's parties and entertainment. In addition, the large hall is suitable for dancing or entertainment of any sort. For dances, an automatic Victrola provided music when it wasn't possible to, to employ an orchestra. Betty Hill, who we mentioned before, who has this phenomenal memory, remembers the Tommy Temple Orchestra performing there. <laughs> Betty met her husband at a dance at the Mem. I wonder how many other people <laughs> met their spouses at dances at the Mem. Uh, many times, high school music groups would perform. Okay, so now, during the 50s and 60s, I'm moving on a few decades here, Blue Inn dances brought in huge crowds. The organization was first called Blue Inn because of the colors of both of Menasha High Schools. St. Mary's had a light blue and white, and Menasha High a darker blue and white. And reminiscing, and I remember those dances quite well, we went in and paid our 25 cents or whatever it was, and they stamped our hand with an invisible stamp. And then you put your hand under like a blue light so that they could see that stamp. And then we could leave and return. Not so much nowadays. When kids go to dances, uh, they don't get their hands stamped so they can go back and forth. Anyway, so we danced to the music of the 50s and 60s. So I'm looking and I'm researching and I'm trying to remember. We have the twist, the stroll, the watusi, the mashed potato, the swim, the chalipso. We had the limbo rock. That was really a good one. They had the pole there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we did the hand jive. People remember the hand jive? Oh, we had fun with that. Okay. So we could do a whole story a program about the blue in, I think, and all the fun we had throughout the years at those dances. And then they also had a pavilion in Riverside Park where we could go to summer dances. The park dances. Yeah, park dances. Right in Smith. Right in Smith Park. Exactly. Okay, so here's a picture. Oh, did they do? We never went over there. Okay. This picture, when I say pickleball courts, it's like there are new pickleball courts. What is pickleball? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, it, I don't know much about the rules, but it looks like miniature tennis. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. Cars are parked all over the place now in the morning, and people just love that game. So if you go down those stairs from the balcony and look to the left, you can see on the new pickleball courts. We really like bridges. So this is one of two stone bridges behind the memorial building going over to what is now the Isle of Valor, formerly Picnic Island. We would imagine that thousands of wedding and graduation photos have been and continue to be taken on this island. Here are well, okay, two bridges shown, and the straight flat bridge is handicap access accessible for those who want to visit the Isle of Valor and all the memorials there. Uh, school kids on tours always want to run across those stone bridges. But, we talked to Marilyn Jerzel, who lives on the island, or did. Um, kids in her neighborhood, she said, enjoyed riding their bikes across the old stone bridges. Well, that had to be quite a feat, because those bridges had quite a, have quite an angle. All right, remember I told you to keep in mind where that nice stone patio was? Well, it ran the whole length of behind the memorial building there and they had big double doors coming out to that patio. And uh, that's where the ladies could sit and enjoy and watch their kids who were in the lagoon or 
playing in the sandbox. And you can see two stairways going up to the two open balconies. And I don't know why, but I've never heard of anyone having an accident. I mean, those <laughs> stairs are open, the balconies are open. <laughs> anyone can go up there anytime. In fact, I found a few students up there from time to time. <laughs> okay, so we're going across the street, and this would be our view from the Memorial Building into Smith Park. And you probably know someone who's been married there or had beautiful photos taken there. And this park has gone on for many decades. And in the spring, the city crews come and plant, and it takes such a long time, but it's so beautiful when they're finished. Okay, I, oh, and I should mention that the MEM can still be rented for wedding parties. So it's really nice, you know, to go in and get ready and have restrooms, and, and then the whole group walks across the street and gets married back in there by that nice gazebo. Okay, now I'm going to just follow up here, almost finished, and talk about our Menasha Historical Society, which was begun in 1956, and it now has its home in the mill. So we are, as you go in those front doors, off to the right. And inside our building, you will find a tribute to Menasha High and St. Mary's High. We invite you to come and visit anytime we have all the Menasha High School yearbooks. So if you ever want to see, like maybe some geeky pictures of <laughs> anybody in your family, come on in and look at those yearbooks. We're missing some of St. Mary's, but we do have all the Menasha High. One of our little displays now is uh, sports memorabilia. We have on, around the uh, mannequin there and on the wall. And we have had donated baseball and football uniforms and caps and gloves, and we try to put them out so everyone can see them. And we're trying to change our displays so when people come in, it's not always the same. You would be very surprised at how many people who've lived in this, these two beautiful cities their entire lives have never been inside the Memorial Building, and they don't even know there's a museum in there. So please come and visit. We wish we could be open longer, but yeah. as with many organizations, we are open on Mondays from 10 to 1. However, uh, the internet has all this information, our website. We will open any time people are interested and want to have even a small group come through. We'll do our best to do that. But there are just um, a group of about five or six of us who come in take turns and keep the museum open. Um, so also a display, the, a lot of artifacts from the Vanta Company, and we still refer to it as the Vanta Company. One of the most wonderful things we got is, if you'll see on the floor, we have Persian rugs from George Vanta's office and from his library. And they're just beautiful, and they make it so warm when you come in and look at the displays. So besides the Bonta Company, we have artifacts and history of so many other mills and businesses in Menasha. And if you can't stay long and you want to take something home, we have a little mini marketplace there. <laughs> yes, you can shop. We have books and DVDs available. And now we have the bricks from the Brin with a nice little plaque on the front of them for merely $10 a piece. And they have little rubber feet, thanks to Nick, and you can use them for paperweights. And, and you know, there, there aren't that many left from the print. We were only able to get a little over 100 of them before everything was demolished and hauled away. So come on in and get your print bricks. <laughs> Okay, this is the end of my presentation, and I thought I'd end it with another shot from a drone that Nick took. Um, one of our goals is to have third graders in Menasha come every year, because that's the year they study local history. 
So they come in and they tour and they look at things and they have so many interesting questions. You know, we, they see things that they couldn't even imagine existed. Mm -hmm. So then this particular day, Nick brought his drone and sent it up and took a picture of the kids. And we just said to them, we're showing you the such technology advancements from the artifacts that you saw inside to this drone photo on the outside. So, and I'd just like to say that the Memorial Building has been, is such a treasure to Menasha, holds so many memories of Menasha's past, and we hope it'll stand for at least another 90 years. And that's about it. so much for joining us tonight. I don't think that we probably should stick around um, to have open questions, but if you'd like to um, ask questions of us or have something to share with us, please do so. We also would really appreciate any photos that people have from Doty Island or Nina or Menasha. We're always collecting historic photos and we'd be very happy to um, scan them for you. Next month, again, uh, Hidden History of Doty Island Part 2 will be at the Menasha Library. We'll be talking about the Winnebago Players, the Winnebago Day School, and the Driving Park. So join us on October 17th. Thank you so much for coming.